Now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. You know, it's a great privilege to be here uh, in Israel with our youth group remnant from Omega Center International, young people that's part of our dance and drama and youth team. And we're at a very unique place because uh, Kutzrim, which is a Talmudic village, goes back to the 6th and 7th century, but the buildings are constructed very similar to what they would have been like in the Roman times. So we are in the synagogue uh, that's very, very old, and uh, the entrance is uh, coming in from this direction in the north. Of course, the pulpit uh, is, the, is in the front here, and because of the way the wind is blowing, we've had to put everybody in the corners to uh, hopefully get the program uh, completed today. Now, being in the synagogue, I want to talk to you for a moment about the Torah scroll. And for those of you that may not be familiar with what we're speaking about, many years ago, I was blessed during my building dedication, first building dedication of Voice Evangelism, for our guide Gideon to carry over to the United States what is called a non-kosher Torah scroll. Now, the Torah scroll is kosher, but the one that we have, once the ink begins to fade, on the scroll, the handwritten ink and the letters begins to fade, no scroll is ever destroyed. It's usually placed in a very special place because to the Jewish rabbis and the Jewish people, a Torah scroll is a living person. Uh, some of those, in fact, it may have been the one I have, some of those have actually been rescued out of burning synagogues in Europe when the synagogue was burning or sometimes during the Nazi regime when synagogues were, were caught on fire, Jewish people would actually go in to rescue the Torah scroll just like it was a living human being. Now, I want to say something to those of you that watch me in North America because this is something that when I began to study this was really put on my heart real heavy. When you see how, for example, in a Jewish synagogue, a Torah scroll is kept and how it's, it's actually dressed up like the high priest was in the Old Testament. You know, they, they put a, a blue uh, garment around it. They take a gold rope and tie around it. They have a breastplate that they hang over it. They have two crowns that go over the wooden handles. And then they put it inside of what is called an ark, which sits uh, directly behind the speaker. And it's stored there and it's treated very, very much with high level respect. I really think that those, especially in North America, that have access to Bibles, whether it's a New Testament, an Old Testament, an entire Bible with the 66 books, I really think we do not respect and treat the actual Word of God the way that the Jewish, devout Jewish people do. Uh, I've seen people just lay their Bible on the floor. I've seen them just lay it on top of the TV guide. I've seen, they just don't treat it with the respect. And, you know, years ago, uh, the Lord began to deal with me personally about how to treat the Word. You know, even if it's laying on my desk at the office, to always have it. My Bibles in my office always sit above everything else on my papers. That's just me. I'm not telling you you've got to do that. But I want to talk about the Torah scroll. Now, what is the Torah scroll? We're going to show you a picture of a Torah scroll right now. The Torah scroll, in fact, let's talk about the word Torah. It comes from the Hebrew word that means to, to teach. It also can mean to teach or instruct. Torah is the Hebrew word for the first five books of the Bible that's in our Bible, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy that Moses wrote originally in the wilderness when the children of Israel were wandering during the 40 years in the wilderness. So when you talk about the Torah, if you ever hear Perry Stone on Manifest talk about the Torah, kids at OCI, if I ever say Torah, understand I'm speaking about the first five books in our English Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And when I talk about the Torah scroll, I'm not talking about just the printed book that we have in our Bible. We're talking about the, the two wooden shafts that this scroll made out of kosher animal skin with handwritten ink is, is written on. Um, the New Testament word used for the Torah is called the Pentateuch. That's a Greek word. And uh, primarily, when you talk about the Torah or the Pentateuch, you're talking about the first five books in the Bible. To the Jews, however, you can say Torah, and it can be the totality of Jewish teaching, which is teaching and instruction. Now, if you've ever seen a Torah scroll, and these five books of Moses are written on animal skin. The animal has to be kosher, meaning you can't use a pig skin. You can't use certain animals. You have to use an animal. Uh, you know, the Bible talks about the split hoof or the cloven hoof, the solid hoof. 
That's the difference between an animal that's kosher and non-kosher. So you have to use a certain type of animal skin. And uh, then what they do, the scroll, once it's handwritten by a scribe, it's put on two wooden uh, uh, shafts, and you can roll those shafts together. And that's how you get the, what, what appears to be the Torah scroll. There are 80 skins of animal, 80 skins of a kosher animal that are used in one Torah scroll, and they are sewn together. And actually, this is amazing, to do this by hand takes at least a year. A scribe working every day, at least a year to pen an actual Torah scroll. Um, it has 304,000 805 letters in every individual scroll. And I'll show you in a moment, the laws of copying the Torah scroll are very strict. And one of those is you have to count every individual letter. Now here's the thing that's amazing. There are 4,000 laws you have to know to be a scribe to copy a scroll. It's not like just sitting down and copying a letter that you copy or you know using your laptop and typing out something you see. They're very, very strict laws. Now. Several years ago, the young people may be a little bit younger to remember this. They were probably kids. Some of them may not have been born when the first information came out years ago about what was called the Bible codes. Now, I'm not dealing with the Bible codes here, but I want to express something that's an opinion of many people. Yekov Ramzel, who's gone to be with the Lord, Grant Jeffrey, who's gone to be with the Lord, great prophetic teachers, a lot of them were very involved in the study of what was called the Bible codes. Now, I remember being in Jerusalem. I've laughed about this because a man named Drosman wrote a book called Bible Codes and sold millions of copies. And yet I was in Jerusalem at the La Rome Hotel in the mid-1980s when there was an article that big in the Jerusalem Post that said they have discovered coded messages in the Bible. And I'm reading it. And I think Professor Rips is the one that discovered this originally. But what they did is they took the book of Genesis without the chapters and without the verses. And what they did, they just simp simply fed every seventh letter. You put the whole Torah in the computer and you tell the computer, I want to skip every seventh letter. When they skipped every seventh letter, it spelt 31 trees that were in the Garden of Eden, but every seventh letter. Then they would start programming it to go to, let's say, to the story of Noah and the violence that was in the earth, and they would find the name Holocaust, Auschwitz, Hitler, uh, swastika, everything connected to the Holocaust, well, like every seventh letter, eighth letter, tenth letter. If you remove one letter and take it out, the whole code falls apart. If you skip every seventh letter, you don't get those 31 trees. If you skip every twelfth letter, you don't get the story of the Holocaust. So in other words, the point was that every letter in the Torah, the five books, is so precise and it's been copied by such detail over the years that it has maintained its integrity and it's maintained its, uh, its uh, inspiration. Now, having said that, I want to explain to you the difference. Now, for you that's watching, you got you to listen to how I'm saying this because, uh, you know, one thing about Western Christians, Western Christians are selective hearers. They hear what they want to hear. You can preach an entire message, I promise you, and somebody will walk away and say, did you hear what Perry Stone said? And everybody else is saying, no, he didn't say it like that. So you're a selective hearer. I know that. But listen to me how I'm going to say this. If, you, if I were to stand beside me here, let's say a head rabbi, and I were to say to him, in your opinion, knowing how to read Hebrew, knowing the Torah, and knowing the Bible, what would you say the main difference would be in Moses writing the five books and a prophet writing like Ezekiel or Daniel? Now, he would give you these verses. Now, I'm going to show these verses on the screen, and then I'm going to explain something to you. Numbers chapter 12 and verse 8. This is God talking about Moses. With him I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. Uh, one of the Hebrew translations of Numbers 12 and 8 says, I will speak to Moses mouth to mouth manifestly, and not in an allegory. 74 times from Exodus chapter 6, verse 10 to Numbers chapter 35 and verse 9, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Do this or say this. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Say this or do this. In Numbers chapter 33 and verse 11, God spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. So let me go back to the original question. If a rabbi is standing here who knows how to read Torah in Hebrew, and he's a student of it and a teacher of it, 
And I were to say to him, give me the difference between why you believe that the Torah has this incredible inspiration to the point that every letter is in place, he would say the difference is God dictated to him word for word. Whereas the prophets would see a vision like Daniel, or the prophets would see a dream or vision like Ezekiel, and they would then write under inspiration what they saw in that vision or in that dream. Ezekiel 37 is the Valley of Dry Bones, a prophecy about Israel returning. I think it's a prophecy, or part of it is, a prophecy about Israel returning to the land after the Holocaust, but it's a vision. Ezekiel 44, 45, 46, 47, all through there is a vision of what's going to happen when the Messiah comes back to earth and sets up the kingdom of I in Israel and all the tribes are allowed to take the territory back and it's got this whole temple that's going to be built. So what a prophet would do is just like any of you, you have a dream that is totally from God, you're a prophet, but then you have to then articulate by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit what you saw and it's got to be very, very accurate. And I believe these prophets are pinpoint accurate in their inspiration. But let's go back to Moses. The difference is a prophet has a dream and vision. He has to be inspired on how to write it. Moses, however, is, and the Lord spake unto Moses saying, Moses, speak to the children of Israel. So he's like, speak to the children of Israel and say, I am the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So in other words, when he wrote and what he wrote, was written, the majority of it was. Now, of course, when you get into numbering, it's just he's writing about the numbers of Israel and how many tribal people they are. But when it came to the law, which was the moral law, the judicial law, and the ceremonial law, which is how to sacrifice animals, uh, the, the uh, moral law, you, you do this, you don't do this, you do that, you don't do that. All of that is a part of uh, the, that, that heavy, very, very, very heavy God speaking mouth to mouth to Moses as a, as a man would speak to his friend. All right, now, let's talk about this for just a second because uh, I'm going to give you for just a moment what I call, or what not what I call, what the scribes say are some of the laws of copying a Torah scroll. And this is those five books of Moses on those kosher animal skins with a certain type of ink. Here's the law. Number one, this is just a few of the laws. Number one, it has to be copied directly from another scroll you cannot copy from memory. In other words, you can't say, well, hey, I can quote that verse. Let me quote it down. You can't do that. You have to see it here, copy it here, see if they're copied here. Number two, you have to repeat every word out loud when you're copying it. If you were to say, the Lord said, and it's in the scroll in Hebrew, you have to say, the Lord said, look at it and speak it out loud. The Lord said and match it. Now, this is how, this is why you know the word of God is inspired. That's the point I'm trying to make to you is because of the laws of copying that were established by scribes. Number three, you have to count every word and every individual letter. Let's say this word has nine Hebrew letters in it. Then this over here has to have exactly nine. You cannot be eight and say, ah, nobody's going to pay any attention to that. You know why? One missing letter changes the word. And you can't change, you cannot alter the Word of God. All right, here's another law. There are no vowels. Uh, there, each letter is without vowels. In other words, the Hebrew alphabet, the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet do not have vowels. Those vowels are placed in modern Hebrew with little dots and uh, things on top or below the letters. Listen to this. This is crazy. Not crazy. This is crazy amazing. If a king walked in, a king, while you're copying the Torah scroll, you cannot look up to greet the king till you finish that last part. You're not even allowed to look up and greet the king. Every time you wrote God's name and God's sacred name, Yahweh, Yehovah, yud heh vav -Heh, that name can be found, is used over 7,000 times in the scripture. Uh, we, we pronounce it Jehovah. Every time, though, you write any form of God's name in the scroll, check this out. You have to wash the pen go wash your hands, come back and dip it and write the name, wash the pen and go wash your hands again. That's why it takes a year to put one together. So in other words, God's name to the scribe is so sacred that you have to treat it with that type of uh, very, 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 very heavy, heavy sacredness, all right? 
Now, in preparing a Taurus scroll, I'm going to read this off the paper here because I want to get this exactly right. And again, we're going to try to show you as many pictures as possible. You have the parchment, which again is a kosher animal skin of either a cow or a sheep, usually one of those or two. Sheep skin is very popular. The ink has to be made with a very special formula, and the numbers, the letters have to be numbered and counted, and they have to be exact in the text that you're copying. It has to be exact. It takes 80 animal skins in order to make a Taurus scroll. There's 248 columns, each column holding three to, four, three to four columns. You have to have three inches exactly at the top, and what they do, they mark these out. In other words, before you ever start pinning it with ink, you have to mark these out. You've got to have three inches at the top, four at the bottom, and two inches between the columns. You have to have a quill pen, and this is usually a goose feather. And you go through a lot of pins when you write because they have to be cut a certain way, making sure there's no mistakes. They have to be actually cut precisely. The ink used to make a Taurus scroll consists of gall nuts, copper sulfate crystals, gum arabic, and water. Now they prepare it in small amounts. Now here's a test question for everybody. If you're writing a Taurus scroll and you're using that type of ink, somebody holler out, why do you only want small amounts at a time? Huh? Well, that's, that's very close. It dries out. The old ink will dry out easy. So what you want to do, instead of having a lot of ink that, well, you said it would blob up, it would eventually dry out. You take a little bit at a time. All right. Okay, the ink has to stay very, very dark for the letters to show up. So in other words, even in the mixture of the ink that a scribe uses with that goose feather to pin those little individual letters, it's absolutely amazing. Now, if a mistake is made, because obviously these men could make a mistake because on some of those little Hebrew letters, there'll be a little gap opening between two parts. For example, if you take the letter hey, you have a line, and you have a little gap there, and you have a, a little curve that comes around. So if that gap is not there, you could change that to a whole different letter. And some of the letters, like at the base, have a little foot, a little foot at the base. But if you don't put the foot in, you've just changed the letter. So let's say he makes a mistake. What do you do when you make a mistake? You scrape off the letters when they dry, and you have to remake it all over again. God's name, however, cannot be erased. Listen to this. If you have made a mistake on how you wrote God's name, you have to take that parchment and bury it and start all over again. Can anybody say, whoa? Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's just amazing when you think about it. You've got to go back and you've got to bury it and start all over again. The scribe will check with someone else three times. Three other scribes will have to come and look to approve now, I hear people say, well, you know, you just can't trust the Bible. It's been changed over the year. Uh, don't, hey, hang on. Don't get me started. When you have these type of laws and you're this strict on copying the Word, especially the Torah, I mean, how can you say it's full of errors, it's full of this, it's full of that? There, these are laws that these people have gone by for thousands of years to ensure that the scroll is properly made, all right? Now, what you finally do is when you have all the parchments done, you have to take the thread, uh, you, you take thread and you sew it together, but it, these are leg sinews of a kosher animal, which can be an ox, a cow, or a sheep, and the thread is called the gedin, and you sew the back of it so the stitches are not visible, visible from the front. Then the, the scroll is sewn on two wooden rollers. You ready for this? The two wooden rollers are called I love this, the trees of life. Yeah. yeah, isn't that neat? The trees of life. And so that's how they do it. Now, Jesus went to preach in a synagogue, and it says this. They brought unto him the scroll of Isaiah, and he found the place where it was written. So how does he find it? He has to take those and turn it this way. And remember, there's no chapters or verses back then. He, he's not going, oh, just flip over there to yeah, Isaiah 61 or 61 well, through 4. You know, you don't do that. You've got to find the place, and he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he found it by taking that scroll and turning it to the place that he wanted that word of God to go. So the, the scroll, and I want to share this with you, that the Torah scroll uh, uh, is very, very well preserved, very well, very well kept in the synagogue to the point that if you, if you open it up and you're going to read from it, they have something called the finger of God. 
Now, we had a lot of these made at one time. I don't know why I did it. I just liked it. I saw one in the synagogue. So I have to give all the kids one if we still have them sometime. But it's called, it, actually, it's something called the Yod, which comes from the Hebrew letter Yud, which means the hand. And it's made out of silver, and it's just a pointy finger like this. And in the, in the actual synagogue, they're real big. So here's what they do. Because it's ink, you don't touch the scroll because the oil in your skin could wear the ink off. So when they do, they open and they'll stand back and they'll read by touching it or pointing, pointing to the individual letters where they could follow the line. So that's another thing. And when a book gets too old and it's not kosher anymore, it's still a living person. And a lot of times there's a burial process that takes place. Now, I want to go back to what I said earlier. We in the United States need to treat the Word of God with a lot more respect than we do. Years ago, when I went to Bulgaria, when communism fell, I found out there was a pastor that under communism for years had one page out of a Bible that was the story of Lazarus. He preached it every single Sunday to an underground church for 10 years. The story of Lazarus is all they knew. So I want you to respect God's Word. As we have been announcing on Manifest, I've completed a New Testament commentary Bible. It's a beautiful Bible. We have limited numbers, but we want to give the Manifest audience the opportunity in America, North America, to get their copy. I'll be right back in just a moment. I'm in my private office at Voice of Evangelism where I spent several years writing, intensive research and writing, going through literally tens of thousands of outlines and sermons that I had preached over the years because I wanted to leave a legacy with men and women and young people. I knew that if those notes remained in cabinets and files and just in this building, who knows what would have happened to them. So I took the best of those notes and compiled them into something I'm ready to share with you right now. It's the Perry Stone Prophetic Hebraic New Testament. This is a 300,000 word commentary and a 1611 King James New Testament. We have a beautiful, it's actually a chestnut color uh, imitation leather cover. We have the best quality paper. There's three qualities of paper in a Bible. We use the best quality paper available. Uh, we also used two colors. We have a beautiful teal green and also black for the Bible text and much of the writing. And what we did was we have the King James translation of the Bible, the 1611, and then at the bottom we have the commentary on every verse in the Bible. Sometimes the verses are compacted together in a group, sometimes they're individual. And we also have at the end of every book of the New Testament what's called an in-depth. And here's the in-depth of 1 Thessalonians. I mean, it's just loaded. So it deals with Hebraic truth. It deals with prophetic information. And I'm going to tell you what you're going to really love. You're going to love the boxes and the commentary in the book of Revelation. And so here's what I need you to do. We have seven major outreaches. I need you to help me this year. And if you will support the ministry with a donation of $95 or more, you can request the brand new Perry Stone Hebraic Prophetic New Testament. It is full of 300,000 word commentary, personal commentary, Greek word studies, powerful information. You will come to a knowledge of the New Testament like you never have before. The offer number is BK018, BK018 for $95 or more. You can call 1-888-21-BREAD or send a check and request the Bible at Perry Stone P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee 37320 or go online at perrystone.org. Now, I only have printed 75,000 copies of this Bible, so it's first come, first serve. We hope to hear from you and I trust that you will enjoy the 300,000 word commentary in this brand new New Testament. Well, thank you for joining me on the Manifest Telecast, and I appreciate those of you from around the world who tune in every week. Now, we're going to be sharing, sharing with you programs from Israel. Uh, these are brand new programs that were just recently taped. So for the next couple months, uh, we will be sharing with you these particular programs that we air in different parts of the country. I tell you what I like to do. I really like to go to places that maybe are new, what we call off the beaten path, and show you a part of Israel or some scenery that maybe you've not seen in the past. And we do know that these are the most popular programs that we have. Thank you for those of you that have taken up our offer, which is our New Testament commentary. 
Uh, we're just having a great response from that. God bless all of you that's letting us know how much you appreciate, appreciate it. Now, real quick, uh, there's a big itinerary coming up for this year for us, and we're going to be coming to Abba's House Wednesday, March the 8th, and that will be one service only. And we're going to be coming to Grace World Outreach in Brooksville, Florida, uh, Friday through Sunday, March the 17th through the 19th. And uh, the, the schedules are on the internet. Don't forget our Warrior Fest, which comes up after that. And also we have a great, great prophetic summit, which is coming up. And that will be on April the 27th through the 30th. That's a Thursday through Sunday. And go online and get the information on that and get your rooms booked early because that is probably the one conference that more people come to than any conference that we have all year. Now, let me just mention to you, uh, it's very important because we have so many people that want to know, are you ever coming into our area? Will you ever be traveling like this city and that city? And sometimes at the last minute, uh, the Spirit of God will come upon us and tell us to go somewhere and minister. And the only way that you can know if we're going to be in that area is to go to perrystoneministries.org, uh, uh, follow us on the Facebook page or, or our ministry website, and that way we will announce if it's a very all of a sudden last minute type of meeting. And uh, you know, social media is just absolutely crazy. It's being used in some places in the world for evil, but yet I believe it's one of those uh, inventions of the end time that help, helps the body of Christ, churches, local pastors, Christian television stations, ministries, whoever they may be, to be able to reach massive amounts of people in a short amount of time. And so uh, it, every time I think of it, I think of Daniel 12 where it says that in the last days many would run to and fro and knowledge would be increased. And we are in that generation. They tell me that now about every three to six months, the technology goes into a whole nother dimension and a whole nother level. Now they're talking about driverless cars. Now I don't know about you, but I like to have a car that's got a human in it that knows what it's doing. Now maybe those cars will work one day, but I'm just not into being on the road with something that don't have a driver in it. You know, people are playing games or whatever in the car and not paying attention. But anyway, technology is just amazing. And I know you know that. Um, I do want to mention to keep up with us at uh, Peristone Ministry Facebook page and also uh, peristone.org for some of the things coming up, including our ISO International Bible School, which will be launched hopefully this summer. So we do need your prayers. And for you partners who partner with us, I want to thank you so much for continually, consistently praying for our ministry. We cannot do what we do without your, we're actually without your support and your prayers. God bless you and God bless all the stations that air manifest around the world. See you next week. This spring at Omega Center International in Cleveland, Tennessee. Don't miss our most anticipated event of the year. Warrior Fest 2017 is so big, we're having two back-to-back -back weekends, jam-packed with a dynamic lineup of preachers, musicians, and dance teams. Come March 24th through 26th or March 31st through April 2nd and hear preaching from Perry Stone, Todd White, Karen Wheaton, Corey Russell, Micah Wood, and Josh Carter in worship with Rick Pino, Eddie James, Lindy Kuna and the Circuit Riders. First to prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna. So get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. I want to welcome you to a very special edition of Manifest. It's very important that if you know someone who has some type of an addiction, it may even be something like a smoking habit or something deeper like cocaine or meth, um, marijuana, pornography. But if you know of someone that has some type of an addiction, I want you to have them tune into the Manifest Telecast for the next several weeks. I have here a very enlarged styrofoam brain, but a lot of people don't realize the damage that addictions are doing to their very organs of their body, especially the brain, because they can't see it with their natural eyes. Today, what we're going to do is introduce Sharon Maloney. Sharon and her husband are pastors of the North Cleveland Church of God, where my wife and I attend. But she is also a counselor dealing with addictions, and she has dealt with many, many individuals who have suffered various forms of addiction. So I want to introduce her right now and tell her what a great, great honor it is to be here and uh, before we begin sharing, let me give a definition of addiction according to one of the dictionaries. It's the state of being enslaved to a habit or practice or to something that is psychologically or physically habit forming. And this would include addictions to alcohol, narcotics, narcotics or other uh, forms of substances that are both dangerous and actually can be deadly. Uh, but here's the good news for all the folks that are suffering with addictions. Addictions can be broken with proper help, 
especially through knowledge, which is what they're going to get on the manifest telecast, determination and spiritual transformation. So Sharon, thank you for, uh, for joining me today. I want, first of all, before we begin, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been involved with the past several years. Well, thanks, Perry. It's my pleasure to be here and to share some things that are very near and dear to my heart and that I'm passionate about with our audience today. Um, I'm a pastor's wife. I have been for 38 years. My husband and I, I think as you mentioned, serve the North Cleveland Church of God here in Cleveland, Tennessee. And um, I'm also a licensed professional counselor and licensed mental health service provider. So uh, we're serving people in the family of God, in the body of Christ, as well as people in our community who are struggling with addictions and all kinds of other issues that they're dealing with. And you know, in public, people are addicted and people know it, but in the church, people don't know it. Yeah. And a lot of times we try to cover it because we say, as a, as a Christian, I shouldn't have this problem. But uh, you know as well as I do that one of the first things a person has to do to get free is to know that they have a problem. How right. difficult, Sharon, is it to get people to admit that? That can be pretty difficult, Perry, because denial, and you've heard that term used in relation to addictions, denial is the first thing, really, that we have to deal with. And so many people don't realize, uh, because of drug use and other things that they've been into, or alcohol, or even pornography and other addictions, their, their brain has been changed mm. physically. And so that's another really huge part of it where they don't realize how, how bad or how extreme the addiction is. And so they're in denial and they think, you know, I can do this myself or mm -hmm. I can help myself or I don't need to go into treatment and I, I don't need anybody to help me. So that's really the first thing that we have to overcome. So, so what, what, what stage does a person that you've seen, you know, when mm -hmm. you've dealt with people, what mm -hmm. stage do most of them have to get to before they say, I need help? Well, some, some people hit rock bottom. I've seen that too. You know, yeah. legal issues, family problems sometimes. I mean, addiction affects families, not just individuals. Mm -hmm. So people sometimes, you know, uh, go through divorce because of addiction, lose their family, mm. so to speak, have legal issues with the court system, right. other things. The good news is research shows us people don't have to hit rock bottom wow. before they get help. They can do right. it sooner. So if anybody's watching right now that has a very serious addiction, pay careful attention because one of the things I want you to do is I know that uh, people with severe drug addictions, with meth, cocaine, mm -hmm. uh, e well, even with pornography exactly. addictions, mm -hmm. you have shared with me how it actually affects the brain. Right. And you have some images here, so I'd like for you just to take it from there. Like, I, I, let's say I've come into you and I have a serious mm -hmm. addiction and you want to show me, here's what this is doing to you in the condition you're in. So take it from there and okay. let's just go. Let me start with this. Um, in the normal brain, in the healthy brain, which you and I have, of course. <laughs> yeah, I hope my <laughs> In the healthy brain, um, God has, our awesome creator, let's put it that right. way. God, our awesome creator, has designed the brain to function very precisely. You know, it's, it's very... Um, matter of fact, exactly fine-tuned mm -hmm. to uh, function the way God designed it. And when we take care of our brain, then it's going to function healthy and we're going to be ourselves, we might say. Mm -hmm. When something goes wrong in the brain, you know, obviously we need our brain to be us, to be who we are. Right. And when something goes wrong in the brain, whether it's through addictions or something else, then we can't be ourselves and we can't function that way. So God designed the brain so that uh, there are billions, actually about a hundred billion neurons in your brain. Mm. And there are other cells beside that support them. So those um, neurons are constantly working and stirring up energy, so to speak, to function and help the rest of the body and function. And do the neurons also, I'm, I'm not the specialist here, does it re do they release the chemicals Either the yes. feel-good chemicals or the yes. negative chemicals, yes. right? Yes, they design, each neuron designs or synthesizes, is the word, its own chemicals, chemical mm. messengers. And those mm -hmm. chemicals are called neurotransmitters. A lot of people have heard that term, but right. they may not know what it is. Neurotransmitters, well, there's over a hundred of those in the brain as well. And they wow. send chemical messages back and forth between the cells. God designed us so that the cells actually communicate with each other. Wow. It's an awesome fine-tuned process, and they do this in a fraction of a second constantly throughout uh, <laughs> the day, you know, throughout any time period. So to answer your question, um, God designed us to have a certain number of those chemical messengers in the body. Right. And the one that really affects addiction is the one that most people have heard of, heard of which is dopamine, where the I've term heard, dope comes from. And I've studied from. on that. Oh, that's right. where the term dope comes right, from. Right, right. Oh, wow. So dopamine is the feel-good chemical right. messenger 
trigger that triggers the reward system or the pleasure pathway, it's called, in the brain. And so um, in a normal, healthy brain, and I'm going to get to some scans in a minute that are going to really oh, show I us saw the this, difference. This is amazing. You have to stay tuned to see this. <laughs> this will me. really give us a life-size really example of yes. what happens in the brain. But in the healthy brain, um, we're designed so that simple things in day-to-day -day life are rewarding to us. Like if I say, Brother Perry, that was an awesome message you right. just preached. Okay, Makes you feel good. That releases dopamine really? for you in your brain. Right, and it's a good wow. feeling. Y'all you know, remember, always tell me my <laughs> messages are good and I'll, my brain will work right. That's a pat, interesting. A pat on the back will do that or a word of holding encouragement. Holding hands, hugging. Holding hands wow. with your wife, that kind of thing, or with your kids, or smelling a steak. Like maybe that's your favorite food or whatever. Interesting. Or eating something chocolate that all releases dopamine wow and so what happens and I'm, I am quickly getting to the no, question go ahead, you go asked ahead. me um, what happens with drug illicit drugs alcohol and all other addictions and I want to emphasize that all other addictions whether it's gambling pornography compulsive shopping which by the way affects wow. both genders equally really I think that's an interesting fact any of the addictions uh, in any of those areas, dopamine surges are, we might say, dumped into the brain. Hmm. And they go to all parts of the brain and the body, in fact. The effects of those drugs go throughout the body. So the liver, the heart, hmm. everything's affected, not just the brain. But wow. those dopamine surges give that feeling of euphoria and that teaches the brain, hey, this feels good, do that again. So if we do say right words, we're positive, very loving, caring, mm -hmm. naturally exactly. we're going to feel good. Natural dopamine. But then if we get mm -hmm. negative, mean, mm -hmm. angry, fussing, right. hateful, right. It, we have a negative effect. So, so exactly. the drugs, these type of drugs that we're going to talk about mm -hmm. actually affect that one chemical that is the feel-good chemical. Absolutely. Okay. Other chemicals too, but especially, especially that dopamine. One. Right. And the thing is that I think is important to point out too is that the natural level of dopamine that we're supposed to have that God designed ends up bottoming out because of all those dopamine surges that have been dumped into the brain through the various drugs and alcohol and other oh. addictions. And so our natural dopamine starts to lower because the brain says, I've got too much. I've got to stop wow. producing. And that's why when they come off the high, they're totally bottomed out. Exactly. And depressed wow. and anxious and yeah, yeah, irritable. Yeah. Right. So now they got to get the, no natural they want the feeling again. So yeah. instead of letting the natural yeah. work its way back up and heal itself by coming mm -hmm. off the drug. Which happens over that time. That explains right. some things. Which happens it really over does. Time. Now, I wanna, I'd right. like to show our audience Let's some images here. Uh, this is an image of a neuron firing. And what happens in the brain is, you know, naturally you, uh, neurons fire. That's an excitability type of response. It's like electricity, it isn't is, it? It is electricity. Oh, wow. It's so amazing. It's the same kind of electricity that you see with lightning. In fact, really? on the image, you might see that it looks like a lightning flash in a way. It's the same, th same um, energy and electricity that you get with lightning or a light bulb that kind of thing. And so those neurons light up and they fire. And when there's excessive dopamine, they light up like a Christmas tree. Mm. And Perry, I want to say this to the audience because I think this is hugely important. Yes. The same thing happens when someone looks at pornography. Research has shown they have looked at the brain mm. when someone looks at pornography, which by the way is increasing greatly among women now. And really? not just men, yes, well, quite Well, that's, that's, that's not even in the natural, th th 20 years ago, that was right. unheard of because right. men are sight oriented. Can mm -hmm. I ask you a question? Sure. Just from your studies. Why do you think that is? Is I, it back to the dopamine thing where there's, they're wanting that? It is, it is basically dopamine, the same type of thing? Right. But I think yeah, for a lot of reasons, of course, we know that with the internet and so right. forth, this is so much more easily accessible. accessible. Right. But also uh, the, the rate of abuse has increased and trauma has increased so much around the mm. world and in our own culture in the United States. And many people end up turning to those kind of things, you know, to ease their pain or to dissociate, wow. and just, you know, get some pain relief, some stress mm. relief. And at first, you know, uh, getting involved in addiction is a choice. Right. But after that, it's not a choice anymore because all of this brain change is going on mm. and addictions change not only the chemicals in the brain, but the structure of the brain. It shrivels the brain. What? And it's just dangerous really? all the way around. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, brain scans show that. So this was an image that you just saw of uh, the neurons firing. Right. And then I also would like to show our audience um, 
what happens in the brain when this dopamine is released. They're going to see an image of how that goes to something called the nucleus accumbens, right in the center of the brain, and then that's distributed throughout the brain. And then we're going to show some PET scans uh, in a moment. And PET scans and SPECT scans. Now these are actual ones, <coughs> though, of a mm -hmm. brain. Okay. Yes, exactly. They show, like CAT scans and MRIs will show structure of the brain, but PET scans and SPECT scans show activity and blood flow in the brain. So mm. that's what we're going to look at next. Um, wow. Coming up now is a, is a PET scan, several PET scans that will show a normal PET scan, what it looks like, and the normal activity in the brain. And those blue okay. and purple areas right. show um, lower activity, and the yellow areas are going to show high activity in the brain okay. or normal functioning, good okay. processing, good thinking, good reasoning, that kind of thing, right. good judgment. And then you're going to see the next image is going to be a cocaine user about 10 days after stopping. Really? After ceasing. Okay. And the next one coming up is a cocaine user after 100 days of abstinence. And what's important about that is when huh. you scan a brain of an, of an addict, right, a right. dependent person, a drug dependent person or alcohol dependent person, you're going to see all kinds of, I'm going to just use the term dysfunction in the brain because of what's happened through the use of drugs and alcohol. Wow. But about 30 days later, when you take the scan, you're not going to see much difference. But 90 days later, or 100 days, as they have seen on the scan there, 100 days later, you start to see some real change. And guess what? A year out, huge changes in the brain. And that's why recovery programs that, like Penile that you and I are familiar right. with, Epi yeah. that one year program is so important because that gives the brain the opportunity to heal okay, this and is, reverse yeah, itself. This is significant. Now, I want to mm -hmm. talk about that, those brain scans mm -hmm. in just a moment again. But a lot of people who have an addiction, they'll say, I don't want to go away six months or three, just let me go exactly. in a month. A month exactly. is not long enough, is it? That's and right. even three no. months or six months is not long enough. Not for long-term and heavy drug abuse right. especially. Right, not for heavy. Right. Now, I noticed on the scans, when you have the healthy brain, it's like yeah. one piece, and then you see these holes. Let's take a look at those if Can you're we do ready. that? Can we you bring up the that? holes? Show them okay. the holes in the brain. And this is someone, again, who's been a heavy addict of, mm -hmm. like, say, meth or cocaine the or something The first thing of that we're nature. going to see is the healthy brain. Okay. These are spec scans okay. that they're going to see right. healthy um, brain. Okay. On, on the screen. This is a healthy brain. It looks or, like, almost like a walnut, doesn't it? It's, yes. And <laughs> it's and it's, it's and I want to just point out that these are not... What they're going to see here is not the actual, uh, like, holes in the brain kind of thing. I'll talk about that right, a little more right. in a moment. But anyway, on the SPEC scan, this is a healthy brain that they're looking at. And that's right. what it should look, look like. This is not the skull right. in the SPEC scan, but it's the brain it's, itself. Right. Okay, okay, now here's an image of a meth addict. This is a good example it, of the whole an image thing is changed. of a meth addict. I mean, oh, the completely. actual brain physically. It looks physically. like someone has poured acid on it, doesn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. And those holes actually don't mean that there are holes in the brain, but it means that's where low activity is in the brain. Wow. So normal activity has now really lowered. Function is significantly lower. Judgment, reasoning, behavior, good, clear thinking, planning, all wow. that has bottomed out. And this out. is why someone who their brain has actually been physically affected, mm -hmm. to reason with them is hard. Absolutely. For them, to, for you to look at them and say That's you're right. killing yourself, they don't understand exactly. it. Exactly. For you to say you need help, mm -hmm. they they ignore it. It's and I, I mean, you got to understand yeah. something that this is not. And let me say something, and I, you, you'll understand this sure. as a pastor's wife. Sometimes we know the enemy, the adversary, uses these things to destroy people. But yes. sometimes we make it so spiritual we forget that in the creative yes. process of the human body. Like you talked about the chemicals God made, mm -hmm. the neurons that God made, that he made it to function a certain way. And we have, to, and this is where the understanding, folks, right now is very important for some of you yeah. to see that this is not just a spiritual problem. It's a psychological problem and it's also a neurological problem. There's literally something happening inside your brain that's causing you to act the way that you're acting when you're not on the drugs. And, you know, like mm -hmm. you talked about divorce and so on. Uh, go ahead. We've got, about, we've got about five minutes here. Go ahead okay. and keep going from okay, here, whatever good. you feel like to go well, with. Well, I was going to say that's a great point, Perry, because um, for years we have preached and taught that we are body, soul, and spirit. Right. And we have done a really good job talking about the spirit, and I That's believe. what I, I said the same we thing. We have touched some on the soul, right. but we have neglected the mind-body connection and the spirit, yes, how that I all is intertwined. That. You know, Absolutely. and we can't leave out the body. We can't leave out the brain. It controls every function. Mm. 
it related to our thinking and behavior and what we do and just, you know, moving your finger and, and even to be able to smell, it's all under the control of the brain. Now, a lot of people, when they, when they t think about addiction, they think only of a meth addict or a cocaine addict, but even alcohol on mm -hmm. a steady basis, and I've got this real right. funny uh, beer can behind me. Some of you may see that on the program. We did that kind of for the young people called Pig Slot Brew. We couldn't use a company name, of course, right. so we, we made up our own name here. But a lot of, you have a lot of young people, they're into the beer, they're into the, uh, the wine coolers, they're into drinking wine, but people don't understand that alcohol, just that consumption on a steady basis, still does have its effect on oh, the brain. Oh, totally. And do we have time for one more scan? Absol yes, absolutely. Okay, here's a scan of long-standing alcohol abuse. And, and our viewers can see it looks very much like a drug-addicted brain, mm. like a meth addict brain. It sure does. And it's yeah. got those little spots that you see yeah. on the dropout points. The same points. holes. Wow. It looks like holes. But what that means is areas of low activity. And, you know, we can't wow. afford to lose any blood flow in the brain or activity or function in the brain. We can't afford it because one little thing that's changed can throw off the functions of the brain in a person's whole life. Is this the reason why we knew a guy years ago when my dad passed Big Stone Gap, Virginia, and I won't call his name, he's since passed away, but he was like the town drunk, and every mm -hmm. rural community had somebody, mm -hmm. and we don't, I don't say that disrespectfully now, right. but we knew him as the town drunk, and he would come by the parsonage and talk to death, but a lot of times he wasn't drunk, but his speech was like he was. In other words, even when he wasn't drinking, mm -hmm. something had affected his speech, yeah. and it was almost like, you know, the slurs, that actually can happen, Ken. In other words, it yes. gets to the point that the motor skills are co totally affected. The five senses become totally affected when someone is heavy in that addiction. Yes. The good news that we have right now for this pro uh, program, this broadcast, is that the brain is what they call plastic. Or hmm. there's neuroplasticity, which means the brain can change and adapt and the effects can be reversed. Wow, listen to this now. Which is awesome. Wow. That God has made the brain to recover. You know, he said for us to choose life. Right. And he has designed us to live. And so in answer to that question, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, some of the effects, though, can linger. I mean, it can take years some, right. for, some for some things, things to change. Some things are irreversible, but many things are reversible. And that's wow. the good news with help and treatment. And see, one of the things, uh, and I want to mention this, and we'll talk about this some more next week, and you need to tune in, is in the act of re the redemptive covenant or salvation, mm -hmm. the word repent. Now, growing up, I always thought the, thought the word repent was go to the altar and cry and tell God you're sorry. Mm -hmm. now, now, being sorrowful is part of the process. But, yes. you know, repentance means to turn, and it actually means to change the way you think. Yes. And when you're addicted, it's hard for you to change the way you think because That's all right. this activity is going on, and there's the highs and the lows. And I know that in one of the... Uh, uh, women of Hope Rehab Centers that we know about. Mm -hmm. You watch those women come in the first week and sometimes they'll come to our services here on Tuesday or North Cleveland or one of mm -hmm. the churches. And it's like, I'm out of here. I don't want nothing to do with this. And it's that hyperactivity. Yes. Then they have the love coming down where they're depressed and they're away from people they know. It never fails. Give them about 30 days. Mm -hmm. Once their systems clear and they start realizing through knowledge like you're teaching them how dangerous this is, they start realizing that they can come out of this and they can be made a complete whole person. In the next, let's say, uh, minute we have, what would you say in summing up a little bit about this to As the folks? far as that goes yeah. right there? Yeah. Yes, that's true. Um, it, it just takes time. And yeah. there, during the time, like when someone's heavily addicted, and I'll just close with this, and, or they've been using for a long time, that kind of thing, we're asking them to change the way they think and the way they behave at a time when it's probably the least possible. Wow. And we're expecting huge changes and, you know, just snap yeah. out of it and get with yeah. the program and get over it. And that's not likely to happen yeah, early on. Because their mind is not operating in exactly. that realm. Right. So I want to say this to you. If you have a bondage or an addiction, you need to begin to seek God and also seek God for a place that you can get the help because it's well worth it. You don't want to spend the rest of your life that way and you don't want your children raised that way. I know you don't. And that's why we're doing a very deep special for the next couple of weeks on addiction. Sharon will be back with me next week, but uh, we're going to make something available here to you, a special audio CD plus a conference that we recently did. We think you'll be interested in this. I'll be back in just a moment. Please give me your undivided attention. 
I have in my hands what is the most significant prophetic word of 2016, and I want to make it available to you. The message is from the International Prophetic Summit with myself, Bill Cloud, Jonathan Kahn, and Mark Biltz. I want to give you some of the titles of what you will hear when you receive the CDs or DVDs. I preached a message called The Return of the Babylonian Spirits Controlling America's Politics. I preached a second message, and this is a very powerful, important message called The Five Epicenters of the Apocalyptic Countdown. Where are the five centers of where all activity will be happening at the time of the end, including the United States? of America. One message that it seemed people enjoyed immensely was Jewish festivals concealed in our last year in heaven. You will discover the last year in heaven and its parallels to the festivals of Israel and how the festivals of Israel are actually concealed in the apocalypse. Another message I preached was America, the preview of our end game. And this is where I found the notes of my father that I've looked for for eight years where an angel of God visited him, showing him something that would happen to America America in the future. He wouldn't talk about it much publicly, but I felt led to share it with the people during this service and in this conference. Mark Biltz preached on God's Day Timer. He preached a second message called Solomon, a type of Messiah or anti-Messiah. And then Bill Cloud came along and preached on warning, the locusts are coming. Bill preached a second message called It's Open Season on Believers and a third message included in our CD and DVD series, And You Shall Know, Entering the Age of the Messiah. Jonathan Kahn preached on the Shemitah template and began to show us how things were happening related to the Shemitah cycle and what will come in the near future. Now, there are 10 CDs or 10 DVDs in the albums. The CDs are $65 a set. The DVDs are $110 a set for, for your donation of that or more. And the CD offer numbers on the screen 16 PS CD the DVD offer is 16 PS DVD you can order online at perrystone.org you can call our office or the 888-21 bread number or Perry Stone PO Box 3595 Cleveland Tennessee 37320 this series from the International Summit is for those who want to know and desire to stay informed concerning the word of the Lord for these times and seasons once again CDs and DVDs unedited, uncut. On TV, you only see about 22-minute clip. These are messages that are 60 to 70 minutes long. I want you to hear the entire message that I preached and not just a clip because the main meat of the message is later on into it and we have to edit certain things out of the television program. Get the unedited version right now of our CDs and DVDs. We're looking forward to hearing from you today. You know, for the next couple of weeks, I was very strongly impressed to show you an addiction series because there are so many people right now that are under all kinds of addiction. So if you know anyone that is an, an addict of any kind, have them watch for the next couple of weeks. Now, for because of the demand on our Prophetic Summit, we're still offering the DVDs and CDs of the Prophetic Summit. You, you saw some of the excerpts, but you didn't see any of the morning speakers, Jonathan Kahn's message, Mark Biltz, or Bill Cloud on Manifest, but those are on the CD and DVD. Please take advantage at this time to go ahead and get those while they're still available for a limited time. Now, I'm going to come to some places I want to tell you about releasing the World Conference, Mommy, Ohio. This is a big youth event. It is just about full, but you can go on the website and get the information on how to register for that. No cost to attend, of course. Evangel World Prayer Center, we're coming back to Louisville July 14th through the 17th, Thursday night through Sunday night. And the information on all of this is on our website. And so that's going to be a major Hebraic prophetic conference. Remnant, by the way, will be joining me for ministry as well, our youth group. Then Summer Reformation, Cleveland, Tennessee, July 22nd through the 24th. That's open to everybody that wants to come, but especially youth groups. Karen Wheaton and Chosen will be with us Friday night and Saturday morning, and it goes all the way through Sunday morning. And don't forget the big fire tunnel prayer line that we pray for everybody in the building. And again, don't miss Summer Reformation. Uh, uh, Griffin at First Assembly, I'm coming there Friday through Sunday, August the 12th through the 14th. Please mark that. We haven't been there for a while. Looking forward to that weekend there at First, First Assembly in Griffin, Georgia. And then, of course, we, we do our annual meeting there in Texas. Uh, Family Faith Church in Willis, Texas will be there um, 
And the information there, of course, is on the screen. And then we come to the Huntsville campus uh, all day Sunday, 10 o'clock and 5 o'clock there in Huntsville, Texas. So all you folks down in Texas, uh, I don't get to Texas as much as I'd like, but you need to come to that meeting and be a part of it. And also, let me just mention Huntington, West Virginia. We've moved it to uh, August the 25th or the 28th, Thursday through Sunday night, Christ Temple in Huntington, West Virginia. That's our big East Coast, kind of Northeastern, we call it. Uh, a summit and, and, and gathering, and we appreciate the folks up there so very, very, very much. We do want to mention to you that we are completing the layout of our New Testament commentary. We're putting together a New Testament, a 300,000 word commentary. Our entire study Bible commentary was a million words, and we couldn't just we couldn't get it in one Bible. So we're going to do a New Testament first, and an Old Testament later, and it will be available in the month of January. I want you to be, begin looking for it, the Hebraic prophetic commentary. We did a I did personally did the commentary on every verse in the New Testament. We have nugget boxes and insight in the back, and just want to throw that word out there to you. And also, we're still working.